So right now I'm recording this meeting, and that way if we use this as a video, it'll have a little intro to it. Um, I'm delighted to have invited and that he said yes, Dr. Bill Bannon, who's been a friend to our program for as long as we started in 2010, I think 2011. Mm -hmm. yes. So he's, uh, I've got to show him later all of the graduates we have, a lot of that comes from the stuff that Bill was able to help us out with. In the early days when we had HRSA funding, mm -hmm. we could have Bill here more often. Mm -hmm. Now we can't um, because we have no money. <laughs> so, <laughs> put it easily. Um, I, that's not to say that students haven't been able to contact him. So what I have done in, in by way of having this session and by offering to him as an opportunity, as the possible opportunity, is that he does private consultation. And we don't have any other mechanism it, within the college. Unfortunately, I'm going to try and get him to be official Malloy at some point. So he knows that it's sort of, you can count on that it would be here. But right now, it's independent mm -hmm. and it's private. And uh, I just to be sure that you know and anybody who would view this that our relationship has been so good that he's allowed us to use his book and offer what we're calling individual modules from time to time but he does this as a whole program and what I'm hoping that uh, unfortunately for Linda you're, you're kind of stuck being the student that you're gonna look at stats and go oh my gosh I haven't even thought about that for a while, but the other students who will have a chance to look at this will have a chance to know what to ask him for. So that way we set up that mechanism of being able to contact. That's the important reason for having Bill with us today. Um, the uh, I'm not going to do a lot by way of introduction. You did see the flyer um, mm -hmm. and he had his he has his own consulting firm called Stats Whisperer. He has contacts on that. It's all online. There are bits and pieces that are incredibly valuable. He has done a newsletter in the past. I'm not sure if you've got new, new ones because I haven't seen new ones. And there are I, should, I should put some new ones. Yeah, but in any case, they're all available. He's been amazingly available. Um, and he'll tell you about ones that you can find for the questions that you heard me asking, bootstrapping and cleaning. Those are the kind of high-end questions. But what I asked him to present today is a little bit of his style of how he does the web um, tutorials so that we can encourage in as best a way possible that if you're a newbie and this is all new to you that you are in, interested in being part of it that you can contact Bill directly um, or through us so that's kind of the official way that I want to be able to say our relationship at this point is sustained so uh, a couple of other colleagues of mine, Dr. Marcia Williams, Hi, Haley, Hi. Dr. Marcia Caton, and Dr. Judith James Borga, uh, Dr. Bill Bannon. I'm doing an intro for um, if anyone watches this video. And the important thing for you to know, too, is because our relationship goes way back, Bill's been uh, kind enough to allow us to have bits and pieces, but he's going to talk about how he does the seven steps. And that's a complete uh, consulting opportunity for our students. I've been trying to encourage Foster. You did the whole seven steps, yeah, right? Sure. Gloria did too, and I think she's coming too. So as the seven steps whole package, this is sort of a sampling of what you would get. Uh, but more importantly, I think for everyone, my colleagues included, is that we never know when to call. You know, I and you can't ask the statistician in the hallway. I just want to ask you a quick question. <laughs> and that's what people do. So we learned a great way to phrase it, and I don't know if you'll appreciate this. Uh -huh. But the way to phrase the answer is, okay, if it's just a minute, stand on one foot and ask me your question. <laughs> and I think that's a really good way of saying keeping the kinds of questions what people would perceive as a question. So my task to him, as you saw on the flyer, was when do I need a statistician? You know, at what point do I have data collected? Do I need to, all of the steps? It's like this giant black box 
oh, then I get there, and then what do I do? And I've asked Bill if he would do that. So without further ado, I'm going to get you started. That you have all of those. I'm going to get this guy out of your way. So that's up in the corner. You're going to see yourself right there in that corner, uh -huh. and that's what anybody who's logged in would see. But you can talk to your slides, and you can use the up and down cursor or just the space bar or stick that out. So it's real easy to, I think this guy works too, but I haven't tried it. So you're going to have to play with that. Right. Bill Thanks, Bannon, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. Hi, everybody. What's happening? <laughs> he starts out in the videos, too. <laughs> yeah, you know, just luring you in, being friendly before I hit you with the stats. <laughs> that's <how> it happened. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, thank you, Ryan. That's very nice. So, so basically, when do you need someone, right? So th there's a process to data analysis, right? Like everything should be able to be broken down into a recognizable process, right? You sit down, you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that, you do this. The trouble is, like, like surgery, for example, right? If you're a surgeon, there's stuff you're supposed to do, and there's stuff you're not supposed to do, right? So you're supposed to wash your hands and then give anesthesia, right? And like all these things, you're not supposed to drop watches in people, which sometimes you read like in the papers and everything, right? So... That's like a model of surgery. You do these things, you don't do these things. So what would be great if there was like a, a method, a process for data analysis that you could follow, right? And right now, there's not a process, right? It reminds me like early surgeries, right? You're like bloodlettings and all this stuff. So you're glad you came, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but... There once was a point where people just did surgery the best they knew how until there was a standardized model of how to do it, right? Right now, statistics is at the point where a lot of people do the best they know how. Some things are included and some things are left out. So if we had a standard model of what to do and when for a data analysis study, we could do it. We know all our bases are covered as comprehensive and we know it would be valid, right? But right now, there's no, like I said, there's no model. So I'm going to go through the seven steps of data analysis model so you can see the entire process of data analysis all laid out. So when, when do you need somebody to help? I guess it's like when you're going through the model, if there's like a snag or you have questions, that's a, and then how, how, uh, how big the questions are, if they're a one-footer or a two-footer, right, <laughs> then, you know, you might need someone or not see someone. So binary logistic regression we're going to we need something to apply to go through the seven steps of data analysis everybody with me mm -hmm. right all right so we're going to go through binary logistic regression which is the rock star of regression and i'll tell you why but first just make sure the cursor's in the middle of the slide just move move the mouse so that it's yeah then then you can either click on it uh -huh. that's one way. all right all right, all right. Here's here's uh here's my chance to to lay some fears. Okay. Let me get your so, picture out of there. So let me move you up a little tiny bit okay. so we don't lose any of your slide. I think it's all I know. Uh, I think you're missing some of it. Oops. Oh, I can grab it, move it up. There you go. Yeah, see it's still got some there. You look at how tiny. This is what we teach in this room. Uh -huh. I can't see the screen. <laughs> I know. I it's know. so awful. I need to get that to be a little There we go. All right. Now the whole slide is in view. That's so real. <laughs> like Tom Thumb. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So here we go. To make statistical analysis, like the goal, the goal should be to make statistical analysis clear and comprehensive. Is that possible? <laughs> right? We're going to see. But that should be something you can expect from doing data analysis. It's clear what to do, right? And it's comprehensive. It includes everything we need to do. It's doable, right? It's clear, but also you could sit down and apply the techniques and successfully do it. And it's fun. So it's fun like this. Did anyone ever hear of Tai Chi? That's the Right? Well, the first thing they tell you in Thai, did you see that? That was 
good moves, right? So that was the, the blabbing professor. <laughs> so um, in Tai Chi, the first thing they tell you is, look, it's healthful and beneficial, but first you have to learn all the moves, right? And that's stressful at first. So at first it's stressful, then you learn the moves, and then it's enjoyable and helpful, right? So it's the same thing with fun with statistics. It's fun after you've kind of gotten a handle on what you're doing. All right. Let me see. All right. So today, we're going to go through the seven steps of data analysis, which is like a recipe for a research study, right? Got a recipe for a cake, you make a cake. You got a recipe for a research study, you make a research study. Okay, so we're going to implement binary logistic regression, which is below because it produces the odds ratio. You all ever hear like, if you eat fruit, you're 10 times more likely to live till 100, and right? The 10 times, that's what people love because you don't have to be a scientist to understand it, right? Like, okay, like that. So, all right. So binary logistic regression is used. So this is a mnemonic, right? There's a lot of mnemonics going on around here. When you have two categories, sometimes they abbreviate categories, they call them cats, right? So two categories, two cats. So that's when you use binary logistic regression. When you're predicting two categories, any, it could be yes, no, could be recover, didn't recover, patient satisfaction, no patient satisfaction, any outcome that's in two categories. So to implement our study, we need examples, right? So we need a dependent variable with a two category response. So every, anybody ever see what about Bob? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Remember that? I feel good, great I feel example. great, I feel wonderful. Right? So, two categories. So, when Bob first saw his psychiatrist in the office, right, he says, you know, are you married? He says, I'm divorced. And he said, why? And he said, because there's two type of people in the world, those who like Neil Diamond and those who don't, and my ex-wife loves him. Right? <laughs> and then I'd include what Leo Marvin said. He said, I see. So what you're saying is that even though you're at, you are an almost paralyzed, multiphobic personality who is in a constant state of panic, your wife did not leave you. You left her because she liked Neil Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that could be our dependent variable. Do you like Neil Diamond? Yes or no? And as I said, it doesn't matter what the variable is that determines the statistics used. It's the structure of the variable. Any yes, no. Liking Neil Diamond, yes, no. Recovering from the flu, yes, no. So if I eat more vitamin C, is that associated with the outcome of recovering? Yes, no. It's just, you know, Neil Diamond, it, sometimes in statistics, what you're studying can actually detract from the statistical methods you're learning. So if I say, Lung cancer, everyone, you know, you're like feeling that, you know what I mean? If I say, do you like Neil Diamond? It's kind of lighter, do you know what I mean? And who hasn't wondered, because I like Neil Diamond, and I say, why on earth would anybody not like Neil Diamond, right? And so, so we're gonna find out. Everybody with me so far, right? All right, we haven't gotten into the, the stats yet, so. <laughs> so who is Thank you, Neil Diamond? Right, so he's a rock star. So technically, we're using a rock star to examine a rock star because the regression model is a rock star. Neil Diamond's a rock star. Right? So he's from Brooklyn. His best-known song is Sweet Caroline, and he's been active since 1958. <laughs> he was one of the first uh, singer-songwriters. You know, like they all used to sing, but they never wrote their own stuff. He's so one of the first singer-songwriters. He should really call me a thank me for promoting him. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we need an independent variable, okay? Now, for our model, the independent variable can be any structure. It can be continuous. That's uh, at the interval and ratio. That's like age. So as it increases, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it means a greater presence of or a less presence of it, so it goes up and down, makes that bell curve. 
or categorical, right? So categorical is a male, female, right? Categories. So the independent variable could be either. Now, such as, is your name Caroline? Right? And I know this because I once had someone in class when I was doing this, and we were saying, who likes Neil Diamond? And her name was Caroline. And she was like, of course. <laughs> and she was only 23. So I said, this seems to be a salient predictor of what would make people like Neil Diamond. So that'll be our independent variable. So you have the independent variable and the dependent variable. Now, here's another kind of variable. So predict, like a predictor predicts an outcome. There could be two kind of predictors for our purposes today. First, the independent variable, which is the variable of interest, right? So if we're seeing a vitamin C cures a cold, yes, no, the vitamin C is the independent variable of interest. But there's other stuff that cures colds, stress levels, um, you know, the heating in the house, you know, diet, all that stuff, right? So if we want to know if vitamin C cures a cold, we want to control for all the other things that impact cure of the cold, right? So it's like this. I might want to say if a positive attitude is associated with uh, reduced chances of having lung cancer, yes, no, right? So then I find positive attitude predicts that lung cancer, no, right? But then I put in, I want to control for other things related to lung cancer, such as like the number of cigarette packs you smoke a day, right? So then I put in the number of cigarette packs, right, like 20 packs a day, then all of a sudden your, the positive attitude is no longer related to developing lung cancer because it doesn't matter how good your attitude is, right, if you're smoking 20 packs a day, that's no good for you, right? So basically it's other things that impact the outcome that we want to account for so we can see the true impact of the independent variable. So age and region. Right? So if Neil Diamond has been around since 1958 and he was hip, <laughs> right? and if he was like hip in 1958 and now people are like who now, right? the, um, we might want to control for age and also region. So if you're from Brooklyn, it's like how everyone in Brooklyn loves Barbra Streisand, right? So you might want to call it region raised, right? So those will be our covariates. So we might have these hypothesized relationships, right? So this is what we have in mind. If you're in the Northeast, more likely to like Neil Diamond. Higher age, more likely. If you're named Caroline, more likely. And if you're named Caroline, you live in Brooklyn and you're older, you're probably going to like her. <laughs> Unless you run into him and you're like, I'm Caroline. He just ignores you. And you're like, oh, I never liked that guy. Okay, so these are the seven steps, all right? So it's like a rabbit out of a hat right here. If you follow these seven steps, you can produce a comprehensive, legitimate, and effective quantitative research study, all right? And if anyone wants these slides, I can send them to you. Are they available? Yeah, I can make them, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go through the first one, study map. We're going to skip two and three, right? And then, because I want you to be awake for four, five, and six. <laughs> so, and then we'll do four, five, and six. Six is multivariate analysis. That's where the binary with just regression is. And seven is the write-up, okay? So we'll apply our study of what makes people like Neil Diamond, right, to these seven steps. Now, this is the study map. This is like a name I made up. So if someone says that I've never heard of that before, that's why, because I made it up. <laughs> now, you'd be surprised when you say to people, like, who are doing a research study, what exactly are you examining? And then they go, uh, right? And, you know, that's easy to do because you have a lot of ideas. When you're smart, you have a lot of ideas, but you got to write it down. So here's what we do. We put on the right side the dependent variable. Do you like Neil Diamond? Yes, no. We put on the left the two covariate, the predictors which are the two covariate variables and the independent variable. So you can see from the arrows going toward the outcome, we're looking at how each of these predictors predict the outcome. Cool? You all ever hear, they say a picture's worth a thousand words? Mm -hmm. this, is, this is what they mean, right? So if I say to you, ah, and then like people start zoning out, right? 
<laughs> right? You just show them the, the thing. You say, here's what I'm looking at. They're like, okay. And they don't have to be a scientist, right? Here's why people love smartphones. And this is Steve Jobs did this on purpose. Because you could pick it up and not look at any directions and start using it, right? The same with this. You just show someone, this is what I'm looking at. And then it's immediately accessible. Well, you know, I'm not promising anything. No, but I, one of the things I, I'm thinking is we ought to make that page somewhere in the dissertation. It boils it down to, we try to do it in, the, in models, and then they mm -hmm. get kind of complicated. The models have too many words. Mm -hmm. But right. there ought to be a page before the analysis of what exactly are the pieces. And the, the, it ends up the clearest one started out with a drawing. And the, the ones I've seen and that people then address each of the pieces. I know some people who did that one at a time and it kept it in line. And so I think that's really a good piece of advice. I won't call it the Bannon draw, study <laughs> map, but I think it's I think it's a good piece of advice. Well, there, there's an old Chinese proverb where they say, he who is lost should look back at the beginning where you started. Mm -hmm, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you ever like do like a literature review or start doing a study? And then you forget what the hell you were looking at. You were examining. <laughs> then if you have the study map, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So there are three stages of. Sorry, I just saw you. The Bachelorette show. Oh yeah, the Bachelorette. Now I don't, I don't watch the Bachelorette, but if you do, it's okay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. So there are three stages of data analysis within the the seven steps model. Is step four, five, and six, All right? So univariate, bivariate, multivariate analysis. Does that make immediate sense? No. Okay. So no, they, they are like the Bachelorette show. All right. So the first show, uh, does everyone know what I'm talking about? The Bachelorette show? Mm -hmm. There's like this show where there's this lady and she's all like, you know, and then there's like a hundred guys all around her saying, pick me, pick me, right? It's, <laughs> sort of sort of regrettable television but it's good for this illustration right so that's what happens is there's this lady she there's all these guys around there and then she picks the ones that she likes and then she makes a final choice at the end of who she is going to whatever they do <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's perfectly respectable okay so step four the uni level uni meaning one Right? So in the Bachelorette show, the first show, all these people, they're sitting there like this, and then they just talk about themselves, right? They're talking about their individual characteristics, right? So in the first show, they talk about individual characteristics of each contestant, and the Bachelorette too. She says, well, all my life I've been looking for, you know, blah, 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 you know what I mean? So, for example, Bachelor Bob here, right? From Ohio, likes hiking, looking for an LTR, which means a long-term relationship. All right? So in data analysis, the first step of data analysis, step four, univariate analysis, uni meaning one, you're looking at one variable at a time. So instead of describing one person, you're describing one variable. For example, if we looked at the dependent variable by itself, we say, do you like Neil Diamond? Then 50 people, which is 50%, say yes. 50 people, which is 50% say no. So you're only looking at that one variable and the characteristics of it. Okay? The next is the bivariate level. Bi meaning two. So in the second show of The Bachelorette, she starts hanging around with all the guys, right? And they're making comments and she's saying, kind of figuring out which one she has a significant connection with, right? So the ones she has a significant connection with, they go to the third round. The ones she doesn't have a significant significant connection with, they go home or wherever they go, but they leave the show, right? So you got Bachelor 1, 2, and 3, right? So if she had a significant relationship with 2 and 3 and not with 1, 1 goes home and doesn't go to the next round, right? So in bivariate analysis, you're doing a one-on-one -on -one test between the predictor and the dependent variable. So it's a one-on-one -on -one test, like, do you, is your name Caroline? You know, do you like Neil Diamond? One-on-one -on -one test, just like the one bachelorette and the bachelor, right? So age, like Neil Diamond. Region race, like Neil Diamond, right? And it's one-on-one -on -one test, and the ones that are significantly related to the outcome go to the next stage. The, one, the variables that are not, don't. 
Okay, this is called, sometimes it's called backward regression. All right, the third, right? So the rose, that's like in that in that show, The Bachelor, the, she like walks by all the men she has a significant relationship with and gives one the rose. And that means that's the strongest relationship, right? So multi, multivariate, multi, many bachelors, many variables. So the third step in data analysis is you take all the variables that were significantly related to the outcome from the bivariate level, you put them in one regression model, you regress them all at the same time on the outcome, and some become not significant, and some become even more significant, and you can see which is the strongest predictor of the outcome, like in Neil Diamond. So, does everyone see how that makes sense, right? I still don't think you should watch the show. <laughs> right. So, how many statistical tests do you need for each stage of analysis? So, this is the univariate test kit. So, there's two types of variables. There's categorical and continuous. So, both of them you run a frequencies test on SPSS. Now, in, like, like in the book and everything, it shows you like one, two, three, four, five, like step step by step, click this, click that, click that, to come out with the output. So I'm not going to do SPSS, I just have the output here. You just have to trust me, it's very, it's, it's very doable to produce it, okay? So for the categorical, we want to present the number and percentage within each category, right? Number of percentage, male and female, like, like Neil Diamond, yes, so. And then for the continuous, we want to present the mean, so like age is continuous, the average age, the standard deviation, the highest and lowest stage, right? We're describing each variable. So there they are plugged in there. So the categorical, the region raised, are you named Caroline, do you like Neil Diamond? And then age is continuous, and this is what the output looks like. So when you do this in SPSS, this is what the output looks like for the continuous variable. So it's actually both, I'm just selecting it because you don't need it for the categorical. So the average age is 35, the standard deviation 7.67, and the dispersion, the highest, the youngest and oldest is 18 to 50, right? It seems pretty innocuous at this point, right? No? Right? It's not so bad. Then we have the categorical variables. So the number of percentage within each category. So the Northeast is 56, which is 56%. La, 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 going down. Then do you like Neil Diamond? 50-50, right? So we're not, we're not tilting it, 50-50. And then are you named Car? Now, you may notice there's a, uh, an overrepresentation of girls <laughs> named Caroline, right? Uh, it's because, you know, it's generated data, <laughs> you know? So then again, you never know if you're in Brooklyn right around where he's from. Okay, so then the bivariate analysis. How many statistical tests do you need to do bivariate analysis? Well, there's four for our purposes here. Now, this is a cross-sectional study. That's where you have one time point, right? It's not like a longitudinal, it's pre-post, pre-post, follow, blah, blah, blah. So for our cross-sectional study, we can consider four. And the one you select is based on the combination of the structure of the two variables. Right, so I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about. So if you have a categorical variable of two categories, right, such as like Neil Diamond, yes, no, and a continuous variable like age, you use independent samples t-test. Right? Now we don't need the center two for this study because we because variable B is we don't need it, trust me. Okay, and then the last one. <laughs> is categorical, categorical, you use the chi-square. Now, here you go. This is all we need to do for bivariate analysis. We need to do one independent samples t-test, because we have a combination of continuous age with categorical, two categories, Neil Diamond. And then the other variables are all categorical, categorical. You see variable B, that's the dependent variable. The predictors are on the left. And you can see when you plug them in, so that's the whole thing, you can plug them in here. Right? So the bivariate test key is great because like once I'm gone, you can plug it in yourself. You don't need me. So I'm making myself obsolete. So cat raised, region raised, and liking Neil Diamond are all categorical, chi-square. Named Caroline and Neil Diamond, they're chi-square. 
So when you do a chi-square in SPSS, like I said, I'm not leaving you dry. There's instructions in, in the, the book. There's also instructions online how to do chi-squares and all that. So you don't necessarily need to ask me. But the chi-square, this is what the output looks like. So what's the problem? It's like, what do you look at, right? Oh, that's true. You, you all oh, where's, hear, where's Waldo? Yeah. Yeah. You all ever hear the Pareto principle? Sorry, interruption. No, I'm saying, you know, because it depends. You have to kind of add it up in different ways to figure out what it is you want to come up with. Exactly. It's like if you go to work somewhere, they give you a big manual, right? And then you have a friend working there already. And they say, all you need to know it's is this and this, right? That's what you need someone to tell you with this stuff, right? So, there we go. That's what we're looking at. First, we're looking at, is the difference statistically significant? Because if it's not statistically significant, in other words, below 0.05 for our purposes, then there's no difference at all, right? It's just considered a, no difference. So, there's a difference because the significance is below 0.05. It's 0 0.000, all right? So we want to, we know there's a significant difference. Then the question becomes, well, what is the significant difference? So if we look in the yes column, we could see the, the percentage is really better to look at than the raw count numbers. So we say people raised in the Northeast, you see that on the, the left there, Northeast? People raised in the Northeast in the yes column, 71.4% of them like Neil Diamond, right? Then in the Northwest, only 23.1% like Neil Diamond, and in the Southeast, 22.2% like Neil Diamond. So what's the conclusion? If you live in the Northeast, you like Neil Diamond. Right, a, a significant <laughs> higher percentage of people that live in the Northeast like Neil Diamond. This, it might be a law. <laughs> so if we're looking at our study map, we can plug that right in there, right? So we say on that arm, Test one is statistically significant. So they're going to the they're going to the show, the next the next stage, right? Then we have age. We do our t-test. That's what the output looks like from SPSS. And then boom. We see in the lower where it says sig two-tailed, that is a statistically significant difference. All right. And under mean, you see, do you like Neil Diamond? Yes, the average age is 38.88. Do you like Neil Diamond? No, the average age is 30.0. So there's significant difference where people of a higher average age are more likely to like Neil Diamond. All right? So then boom, right? So this whole thing gets unwieldy really fast. Right? So you got to keep everything managed like this. Right? So you got to. Bill, I'm going to ask you to do one uh -huh. thing for me. Go yeah. back to slide because yeah. it's on video. I want you to talk to people on the video and wow. tell them what the Levine test. First, tell them they don't have to look at it. Right. But so <laughs> often they'll look at the Levine test instead of the T test and start recording the Le Levine test. Anne Marie and I have both had that as a as an issue. But if you look at the SIG under Levine test, ignore it. Right. Unless it makes you look at a different number. So right. you want to do quickly what that means? So I like the Levine's test. So I always I always hear like this like lady like, darling, this is what I'm telling you, you know? <laughs> um, so so, uh, so I think I, I heard the name Marsha Levine once, and I always imagine her talking during this test. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Levine's test, you see it says equal variance assumed, equal variance not assumed. When there's equal, when the variance is not equal, right? So you have two categories, yes and no, right? And then we're looking at the variance of the residuals for age. When the variance is assumed, the Levine's test is not going to be statistically significant, which means it's above 0.05, and then you use the top row of numbers, right? So if it's 0.05 or below, it's significant, but it means it's significantly unequal variances. So you use the bottom row. Take the little arrow thing because it'll show up on the video. Do right the, that's right. Just slide so, yeah, so it along. If, if it's equal. If this is 
above you just use the top line yes yeah, so if it's point if it's above 0.05 you use up here if it's 0.05 or below you use down here and that's important because it's so forgotten because SPSS gives you so much stuff. And like a lot people of see significance, they see that 0.05, mm -hmm. and suddenly they're saying that it, the, the, the test itself is significant, and it's not. Right. And you have to look at the T value to see what that is. Yeah, that's bad so, significance. That's bad the significant. first 0.05 is bad, bad significance. significance. That's a good way to put it. It's so tricking you. <laughs> it's tricking you. And then Mrs. The, Levine is tricking the you. The other thing I think is... Um, the feeling like, oh, but if I had equal variance, I would have had significance. Uh -huh. So it's like saying if I had blonde hair, my life would be much right. different. You know, I mean, it isn't there, so it isn't there. Right. That's so like in England, they say, if your aunt had a hat, she'd be your uncle. Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you know, that's exactly right. I, I love what you do on the video because all people are hearing your voice, and you have ways that people can remember that, which is why I wanted you to be able to say that on this particular recording. Well, you're absolutely yeah. right. It's very annoying when the numbers don't come out the way you want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, come on, people. <laughs> and a lot of the times, the significance is different for the equal variance yes. assumed and not assumed. And you're like, oh. You want to read the other one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, but, Ben. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. So test two is significant. Then the Caroline. So this chi-square. And we can see the first thing we look at is the bottom right is statistically significant. So there is a difference. What is the difference? Right. So if you look in the yes column, you'll see... People not named Caroline, Car named Caroline, no, 19.2% like Neil Diamond. But people that are named Caroline, 83.3% like Neil Diamond. That's a big difference. Now, if you'll notice, so bing. So if you notice here, right, so everything is about like contours. Here we can see which variables are significantly related to liking Neil Diamond, but we can't see which variables are more strongly than other variables related to, to Neil Diamond, right? And so if you have three people that like you, you're like, I wonder who likes me the most, you know? You need, a, you need like, a, like a test, right? So that's what the next stage is. It's saying, of the significant predictors, which is the strongest? And you can't see it here. Now some will be, you'll say some are no longer significant, some are more significant, so we have the univariate test K, we have the bivariate test K, and now we have the multivariate test K. And so this is if we're going to use regression. If we have a continuous variable, we do linear regression, categorical with two categories, binary logistic, categorical with three or more, multinomial logistic. Okay. So in our case, we have a dependent variable that's categorical with two categories, like in Neil Diamond, yes, no, so we use binary logistic. You see, it all makes sense if you, like, have these little things to follow. If you don't, it's rather nebulous and frustrating. <laughs> all right, here we go. So the first thing we need to think of here is observe the structure of the predictors in the model. <laughs> so the first one is what region of the United States are you raised? It has more than two categories. The second is your name Caroline, has two categories, and the third is continuous. Now the problem we have here is in a regression model, the variable has to be either dichotomous, which means it has two categories, or continuous for use in the regression model. Here we have a, a, the first variable, region, which has three categories. So we can't use it in the regression model. So what to do? This is like the time you would call like the... Right? Uh, some people say... I, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Some, <laughs> this is on one foot. Yeah, I just but, have a question. But this is like a landmine sort of thing because unless you knew it was a problem, you might not know it's a problem. You might just put it in categorical without dummy coding it. So that's what we need to do. When we dummy code it, Yes, it's another mnemonic. You got a dummy, you got a code, you got a dummy code, right? So when you have a predictor with one variable, with more than two categories, you have to dummy code it, which means you make each variable a yes-no variable, right? Some of you all have heard this many times before, so thank you for listening again. <laughs> so anyway, so what does that mean? 
So that means there are three categories within the region. So northeast, southeast, and northwest. So each of those has to be a separate variable, as in one variable, northeast, yes, no. Another variable, southeast, yes, no. Another variable, northwest, yes, no, right? So for example, the northeast would be northeast is coded as one, then the other two are coded as zero. Right? And you'll see in the model what it looks like. So, and like I said, there's other stuff online too about dummy coding. You know, you just have to know to do it. That's what you just need. You say, you have to do this. Then you go to Google, you Google it, and you know how to do it. You just need the person to say, you need to do this. So the, in the regression model, the first category is going to be left out to serve as the reference group. You'll see what I mean. So what do we want to look at? after we run the regression model. So we put all the predictors in the model, then we run it. And then we have a lot of numbers. It's like a page of numbers like this big. So what do we want to look at? So first, the overall significance of the model. If the model's not significant, nothing else in it's believable. Like if you know someone who's a known liar, you know they're a liar. So whatever they say, you're not going to believe it, right? So if the model's not significant, we don't believe anything it says. Right? So then after the model, if it's significant, which predictors are significantly related to the outcome. And then we want to know, of the significant predictors, which is the strongest predictor of the outcome, okay? Because you can have a significant relationship, but the effect size is so small, you all ever sometimes they say, you're 10 times more likely to do this, and then you'll hear people say, you're 20% more likely to do that, right? So, it doesn't sound much different, right? But it's hugely different because once you get below twice as likely, that's when you get into percentages. So if something's like three times more likely, then it's two times more likely. Then if it's less than two times more likely, it's 90% more likely, it's 80% more likely. So they're smaller effect sizes. So if I say to you, if you do this, you're 10 times more likely to get rich, and if I say, if you do this, you're 90% more likely to get rich, what would you do? The, the 10 times more likely, right? <laughs> but but you've got to know it, right? So we look at the effect size. It's just a, a nice phrase, getting rich. Okay, so the overall regression model significance. You'll see this, the omnibus test of model coefficients, and it's highlighted 0. 0.000. So the overall model is significant. So then we move on. I don't know who that's supposed to be. <laughs> I just thought it looked kind of interesting. Anyway, my wife's like, it's so boring. you got to put something there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, so then we look at the individual predictors. All right. So now you can see at the bottom, Caroline 0. 0.000. So statistically significant. Age below 0.05 at 0. 0.001 is statistically significant. But now the region was significant at the bivariate level, now it's not, right? So that could suggest that the, one of the other variables explains the other predictor over and above. So like, if you were named Caroline and you're in Iowa, you might be more likely to like Neil Diamond than if you're not named Caroline and you live in Brooklyn, right? So there's something, something where the, that made the region no longer significant in the context of the full model. And that's sort of annoying because this is the reason when you have a, like Caroline, right? It could have been the case our independent variable was no longer statistically significant and region was the stronger predictor. That's why you run this stuff because you want to be able to say, well, I controlled for this, that, and the other thing and the independent variable was still significantly related, right? Y'all dig? Right. Because people say that. Did you control for this? Did you consider that? And you want to say, yes, I controlled for all that stuff, and it, the independent variable was still related to the dependent variable. Now, you don't, we can't illustrate it here, but the northeast is left out of the model. So these two findings, the northwest and southeast, are in reference to the reference group. So suppose northwest was 0.05 right? It's not, but suppose it was. Then we would say, and there's a minus, which means less likely, we would say, in reference to the Northeast, people in the Northwest were significantly less likely to like Neil Diamond, right? So you just have to remember, although the reference category isn't shown, 
the findings for the two other categories are in reference to it. You all see what I mean? Because sometimes if you don't know to do that, you might put all three in there and then that's not valid. All right. Now, we're looking at the odds ratios, right? Now, age is continuous. So the odds ratio for age isn't as interpretable as if it's categorical. For example, if you name Caroline, you're over 12 times more likely to like Neil Diamonds. Right? So that's our, that's, our, that's our finding, basically. So when we control for region and we control for age, people named Caroline were still about 12 and a half times more likely than, pe well, you know, so says term, than people <laughs> not named Caroline to like Neil Diamonds. Right? And then, but ancillarily, higher age was associated with a greater likelihood, and at the multivariate level, region was not. All right? We all good? That was like a lot of stuff I just laid on you in like 40 minutes. <laughs> you know? Go back one slide again for me, and again, for me to try uh -huh. and do some more highlighting. One of the things I go back to that your video mm -hmm. all the time because you have a very clear way. You've yellowed the EXP B, and he said it's odds ratio. Why in the world SPSS didn't call that odds ratio? But that's the odds ratio column. The yeah. other thing that's important to know, and he does it in the, when he explains them and does it more slowly. Again, I use it when I've got results. I go back to Neil Diamond. I swear I go back to Neil Diamond and Caroline. Because um, if, if you were going to say the 12 times more likely is easy to say, it's 12.49 times more likely. That's easy to say. And when you read someone's twice as likely, three times as likely, that's what that number is going to come off of. But when you get those fractions, they're harder to do. And he has a very, I'm not even going to try and tell you what they are, but he has a really clear way of being able to say, if those happen to be significant, but they were fractions, oh, that, how yeah. you're able to say it. It's a, it's a, it's a one over and a, and right. I can't that's even right. do it. I don't know if you're going to do it in subsequent slides. I just want you to point Oh, no, out. but that's right. You divide one by the exponent. Uh, the exponent so one divided by 0.26 would come out to be something like 3.5. And that would mean 3.5 times less, less likely. likely. So you change the way you say it. And like I said, yeah. all of those words is what blow me away. I'm a pretty smart person. But every time I have to go back and rewrite it, it's not something I can do easily. I go back, and Laura, you can relate to this, right? You go back to that regression. You go back to that model. And then you need something to remind yourself. That's when I go to Bill's work. And, uh, and, and it, it, even as he wrote them out in the next slide, being able to say, it's sort of that step between, here's the printout, like you said, and what do you say about it? Right. Um, so that's, that's something that I think is missing in lectures, in statistics courses. They don't get to that point. They show you the graph, they show you the chart, and then they don't tell you the words you actually use. And, and I haven't found a good book. I think the Stats Whisperer book is one of the better books to be able to give you the words to use. So again, it's not a plug because I ain't making anything. <laughs> but but um, I really like that you do that. And, and even though your contrived stuff didn't give you a 0.05 for Northwest. Mm -hmm. Would have been nice to be able to show how you could then say 25, 1 minus 0.2, be 75% less likely, right. or, or it probably isn't that much, but you'd be no, able I... to say it and, and to lay out those words. And I always go back to old models. That's kind of when I'm doing stats. I always go back to something I know is correct, and then I refer back mm -hmm. to it. So those of you who have been my student know I hand you another book and say, see how they did it? Do it just like they did it. Because to try and say it, it doesn't stay in your brain. And I start thinking, Caroline. <laughs> so thank you for, for giving me that chance, at least for on the, on the recording as well. Well, and, and another thing is, is like, like I remember in my master's class, the advanced statistics, were, was learning a chi-square and a t-test, right? And it's kind of not meaningful unless you know where it's embedded in the seven steps model. Because you're like, well, I know these two tests now. What the hell good is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you know that that's part of step five, 
like the bivariate analysis, they're like, oh, okay, so now I know part of step five. Then I can learn the rest of step five. Then I can learn six and all this stuff, right? <laughs> so it's kind of meaningless to know like one little, sometimes they say like a little bit of knowledge will kill you, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's like this. It's like if you don't understand the whole outline and you're just learning little pieces here and there, right? You don't know what it's good for, right? So you need to know the whole outline. So EXPB is odds ratio. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I, I you get to know me. I do stats a lot, but I have to always remember in that column. Because people like to talk about the confidence interval, and they like to talk about stuff. Um, I learned confidence interval, and I would actually put northwest based on what, no, it's not below 1.0. I would take the upper or the lower if it crosses a 1.0 line. Mm -hmm. That was the way I learned it. We all learn different ways. So you take, and if you show that column, the upper and lower right, right columns here. right there. No, but you're right. If, if, that's if the null value. That's, that's the null value, which simply means if it's below, if that range is below 1, it's, it'll be significant. If the whole range is above one, right. it'll be significant. So I have always reported those. You'll look at right. medical studies. Yeah. They will often report the confidence intervals. They do the odds ratio and the confidence intervals, and then it's just, you know, spaghetti, and I don't know what it's meaning. But if you look at that, if it crosses the 1.0 line, it means you don't even you can take out the 0.05s and everything else. It's statistically significant, and that's why you see the 0.07, which I like to talk about. It's close, and I know my friends let me do close. Well, it's approaching. It's approaching. It's approaching. It's approaching. It's approaching. It's approaching. Or it's a trend, or we have to be cautious in interpreting it, right? But um, it, you can see when it's close to that 1.0 line, mm -hmm. because it's a ratio, it's close to right. what what's set at the alpha. It just it just can't include the one. It cannot include the cannot one include in the, the range. I also have a graphic depiction that I had learned on odds ratios. Uh -huh. And I've asked people to do them, and SPSS doesn't do them. My colleague did them, and I think they come out of SAS. Mm -hmm. But they show the bars right, yeah. with right. a 1.0 line. I'll get the variables, uh, region of uh, northeast or southwest, age, Caroline, and they'll show bars. I don't know if you use it that way. They'll show the bars and, and the, a dotted line at the 1.0, and then you look at the ones that are above or below, but none of them that cross. Right. And that's another interpretation of an odds ratio that you can easily see which of those. And the last question, this is a question for you that I always get confused with, and I think the way you said it, I get it. Uh -huh. It's the whole shebang taken together. Right. So the language we can use is by putting it all together, I've controlled for right. those things. Because the difference between controlled for or moderated by right. or separating out to only do the Northeast Carolina and, and, right. or separating those out, um, the language of controlled for means that if, and he showed you, if you ran each of those regressions alone, by themselves, they'd start looking like you could make some prediction about it. When you put them together, last question. Uh -huh. We don't care if there's an angular bomb head. No, <laughs> we no, no, no. have to do our statistics. It's science. It's science. <laughs> um, so the last question I have that I always get confused about as well, uh -huh. um, when I get a multiple regression, Right. Or when I put it into SPSS and right. I do stepwise or hierarchical, mm -hmm. and if you change the order that you put them in, mm -hmm. does that change the chart you get? Not that, like, that last chart looks like that's going to be that way no matter which way you put them well, in. Sometimes they do the hierarchical, and that's the point of it, is like you'll put like, like say age first and it's significant, then you'll put named Caroline, and that's significant, but then age is no longer significant. Oh, yeah. Then you'll have like step three, which is the full model like this. But as step three, if age is above region and Caroline is above, usually it doesn't change like that in my experience. Okay, okay. Because I've always, I, you know, when, in trying to put them into the model, mm -hmm. um, in testing each one at a time and then adding another one, you look at the R squared change, right? You look at the change, yeah. well, but I still don't know how to conclude. 
I'm still always confused on being able to conclude. Well, they like the final step. Go to the final yeah, step, usually and they then it's all there, the and that's step. everything in the model controlling for everything. Right. All right. Thank you. Controlling for is like, do you ever see It's a Wonderful Life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, remember Clarence came along, and he popped him out of the life there, and then he saw how everything changed? Mm -hmm. So what he did was he controlled for his influence on Pottersville. Right? So he said, if you were never born, this is what would be going on. So he removed the, he controlled for, way to think of that. yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, um, if, I ran, if I ran this again, if I ran this again, <laughs> took out region, and I only put two variables in, would I have a stronger model? Or would I have a? Well, the thing, one of the assumptions of uh, regression is that the, all the significant predictors in the data set is supposed to be included in the regression model. Okay, so you start so, with so, the predictors only. Well, Don't even put in the ones at, that aren't. At the bivariate, okay. yeah. Okay, and then when you put those in and some get washed out, right? then your conclusions are, but you know, I feel so bad for people who, and we just had it last week, this past week, where when they all went into the model, suddenly that she could have said something, it didn't do anything. But there's not supposed to be too many either. Right. So you're not supposed happened. to have like twelve. Yeah. No, you know this, was I mean? only, this was so, only. So yeah, you should like five, like five. It was significant six, by like itself. Yeah. Putting it in then, and and the uh, bear, the uh, R square was pretty small anyway, oh, because like right. you said, other things account for it. Right. But I want people that have spent all this time to do all these stats when they get it only accounts for five percent of the model and you go oh what I do that for <laughs> and that's the one thing when you and then that and then quite frankly say, I'm not doing stats I'm just going to do something else at least I can make a statement and that always frustrates me because the important thing with a statistical consultant is you want the inflection in your voice to be excited and that it's fun look at this you have significance here and we have to be able to conclude something's going on. Mm -hmm. Regions, something's going on. If you didn't consider it, some, something about the region, but you gave a great example. If you happen to be named Carolina and you live in Ohio, then it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Right. Because by, by itself, something's going on. And then and, there's always confounders. Well, like someone in, someone in Indiana named Caroline. Wait, I just moved from Brooklyn last year. You know what I mean? So there's all these like confounders and stuff going on behind the scenes you don't know. That's right. Well, I mean, we can all conclude this accounts for a large part of the model, and I think that you can say that something like 12 times. I think you can make a good case for this as a model, but uh, as I said, we lose the inflection. I know Amory's had where you, you do all the tests, and then your p-value is 0.06, and then you're, oh, nothing happened, nothing. And that's not true. Right. And I think it tells yeah. you something, and well, so we're trying to teach that language. If something should be related and it's not, that's interesting, too. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Because it should be this, and then it's not that. And so right. why is yeah. it yeah. that? You yeah. learn as much from non-significant results, you know, when the variance, when the model accounted for a very small amount of the variance, a.k.a. the family sentence study, that was like, okay, well, there's something else that mm -hmm. something else is in there. Right. Yeah. There's because, something else that we didn't capture. Well, then there's a publication bias, which is a terrible thing, because, like, if I do a study, if I do an intervention, and I do it 100 times, and it works one time, and then I publish it, then how, how often does it look like it worked? It looks like it worked 100% of the time, because I only published the one time it worked. Well, the only thing they don't want to. The yeah, they don't want to talk about the ninety-nine times it didn't work. Yeah. So the publication. Or process. vice versa, if somebody has not significant results and it doesn't get published, then you know that information, which I think can be important information, isn't published. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. It's important. Yeah. I, Preaching to the old choir. <laughs> yeah. well, so we then, we're need the words too to help our students. So. Oh yeah. So so actually the yeah like. In the book, too, there's, like, write-up and there's, a, like, a template because the scientific language is complicated. Mm -hmm. So the Bachelorette, it's just a show. Everyone's smiling, you know, for peer review and writing up your research report. It's a bit more structured. It's probably equal to the other six steps before it. Okay. The elephant in the room. So seven steps of data analysis model addressing the elephant in the room. So, like I said, to start off with, it's widely, not widely discussed, but there's no standard model of data analysis, right? So you'll notice, like, in publications, some people will 
have bivariate and then they won't have univariate and then they will have, won't have bivariate, not multivariate. And also the, the tests of assumptions, right? Some will look for outliers and some won't look for outliers, right? So just like surgery, some washing their hands, some aren't washing their hands, right? That's no good, right? So there should be an agreed upon standard model of data analysis where people look at it and, and it's replicable and people say, yes, this is the way to do it, right? So not, not necessarily even this model, but there should be a model where you can like go to medical school and they teach you the steps of surgery. You should be able to do statistics where they teach you the steps of the process of a quantitative study and all the foundations are agreed upon, right? I think stat classes teach you statistical procedures. Right, so they, they teach they you a statistical test. Right, not, they don't tell you how to. Not, not the sequence of not steps. The application, and not the application yeah. research. Right, so. application, that's the word. They don't teach you how to organize it and apply it, which is what you need to know. Right, because you don't need to know those formulas because the. Oh, they're yeah. doing it by hand yeah. stuff? Sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, they, well, they you do it by hand. Formulas. You don't necessarily have to do it by hand. You just have to calculate it and do it all. Yeah. But you need to know the, the global really know things. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So if there were a model, you could teach people, right, students and everything. You don't have to be frustrated and know little pieces. This is how you put it together. This is how you do it. Right? And, uh, yeah, so... Intro, and then that's another thing, the way statistics is caught, taught. A lot of the times, like in the master's, they'll teach you bivariate stuff. And then in the doctorate, they'll teach you like regression and stuff like that. But you can see right here, it's, as they say in Brooklyn, it's no big whoop. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can handle, it's not like plutonium. You know what I mean? Well, that's the second reference to nuclear things. <laughs> but it's not like plutonium. You could know what regression is. You, you know what I mean? If you don't know what it all is right away, then you're lacking. Right? And like I said, in the published research, the quality can be uneven because, like, for example, the we skipped over checks of data integrity. But one of them is looking at, like, outliers, right? One outlier score can change the results of the study. And that's not a, 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 uh, an accurate finding. It's a finding based on an aberration if one outlier is driving the findings. So if you're reading a research study and one says we checked for outliers and there was none, and then the other one doesn't say we checked for outliers, how in the heck are you supposed to have any confidence whatsoever in the second one that this doesn't say we check for outliers? And how many studies say we check for outliers? Oh, I just, I Not many, right? I didn't do it either, right? So that's what I mean. So <laughs> when, when, you're, when you're writing up the stuff, you're also going through those steps, right? Here's what we're looking at. Here's the checks of the integrity. We did this. Here's our univariate, bivariate, multivariate. So just a, just a point of uh, reference. So... A standard model might be a very rich contribution to the researchers now and all the future people we're going to torture by <laughs> teaching them statistical analysis, right? And then, oh, so for further reference, you can see the textbook, the webinars, available on our site, and that's that. Thanks for attending. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Do you think you hear that from when you do it live? When you, when you start, you've been doing these live, right? You've taken a class. Sometimes I do it live, but technical difficulties, some, I record it a lot, too. Mm -hmm. and put it so I just wonder if you hear from people when you're doing it live like this. I mean, yeah. do people um, oh, stop yeah, they, you as you're going along? or? Well, they have the little thing where they write comments. Oh, they can do comments. And, yeah, and you can okay, read it. Okay. So what the hell okay. are you talking okay. about? Okay, I just, <laughs> just lost me yeah, six slides ago. <laughs> yeah. I'm out of here. Right. You know? <laughs> what I want to yeah. do, again, the purpose of not so much learning logistic regression, but more about that the style that Bill will use for our students and for people will refer. The most important thing I want to hear from, from you guys is um, where you would see you might need a statistician. What sorts of, uh, not necessarily the question, can I, I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned to him bootstrapping, I mentioned to him outliers, I mentioned to him missing data. Those are the kinds of things that he said, well, then you need a statistician. So are there any things that, that um, Marcia, I know you're working on a data set. Um, what, what would be the most helpful to you?
You haven't looked at the raw data yet. No, I mean, I think that he'll say the first step is looking at your raw data, and one of the first things you look at is, is missing. Oh, I did, I, did, I did look initially at the raw data. There was an outlier. You have an outlier? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So then you have to figure out how to deal with it. That's where I think Amory is really strong and can help, or we can in the center. But when it gets to something, a statistical manipulation, uh, in transforming things. Uh, if your data don't distribute nicely, you're going to have to transform them. And do you do these transformations or talk to that or talk with people about that? Yeah, the re transformations are cool, but the reasons I don't like them is because when you transform the variable, like if the mean age is 35, right, and then it's a non-normal distribution and you transform the variable, then the mean you get within the transformed version is no longer meaningful. So it'll be like the, the mean will be like 37, 38, 39. So it, it changes the actual statistical parameters of the variable. So a lot of the times what I might do is I'll say take out the outliers, right? And then it say it's more normal. And then I'll run the test with the outliers in it and without, say, the few outliers, with them missing. So it's like 100 people then 97, the few are missing. And if the results of the test, like the regression or, or what have you, is, is similar in terms of statistical significance and all, that would suggest that the non-normal distribution and the outliers are not having an undue influence on the findings. So I just might use the whole group. But if those three are driving findings, I'll just leave them out and I'll write there were three, three, omitted three rotten omitted. apples okay. causing, causing us stress. Everybody worries. I can't do that. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. So you get a statistician to say, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. and it's really funny that you have to have the permission of making a change. Some, some would call it, well, you're just manipulating to get the results you want. That's simply the negative part. And we get into these arguments. You get two statisticians in the room, and they'll argue. And so you're wondering what's correct. And I'm hoping I convey enough that there are a lot of ways to slice this mm -hmm. and a lot of ways to look at data. And, uh, and then when you get the confirmation from someone who's run them in different ways and knows the likelihood. Another thing that happens to us that uh, is a, a real common problem mm -hmm. is uh, the small sample size. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and what no one learns, and I'm going to ask you guys, have you ever learned non-parametric tests? Do you know Man Whitney Hughes? Do you know Wilcoxons? Do you know the, uh, the, the those? They just don't teach mm -hmm. because we force our data into being interval and ratio, and we don't teach it. Tell me, because I'm always reluctant, are they as believable? Well, the non-parametric tests are bang, based on rank order. So the, the parametric tests are based on, like, the variances. Like, the scores go up and down and la, la, la. So when you get, like, a small sample, then you only have nine scores. It's like, it's not really going up and down too much because there's only nine scores, mm -hmm. right? So a parametric test is based on rank. So you... Non-parametric. Non-parametric. Non-parametric based on rank. Yes, that's right. Right. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure because that's something that then goes us all away. But I just want to ask you from your experience with the med school, with drug trials, they're strong too. What's that? The non-parametric Oh, yeah. Usually they agree. Usually if you do a parametric and a non-parametric, let's say like 20 people, usually the statistical significance is either they're both significant, the non-parametric and parametric, or they're both not significant. Mm -hmm. And you might even report the parametric and then mention in the methods, we also did this with non-parametric tests because okay. it's a small sample and the statistical significance mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. the One that same. really shows off all the time is, and there's so many clicks you can make in SPSS are correlations. So do I run a Pearson or do I run a Spearman yeah. or do I run a, and, and I they're all of the both. rules. Yeah. Yeah. So we run them both and you yeah. see they're the same, but then the editor writes or some reviewer writes back, mm -hmm. you obviously have ranked data, so why did you run a Pearson? So you want to know the Spearman, I'll tell you what it is. But that's what I mean about having the confidence that they're really the same. They're really the same. They're when statisticians debate when you have data sets and, and they, they just you tell a nurse that they could kill the patient and they're not going to go near it. You know, it's wrong. You got red data, that's wrong. So I'm hoping to try and convey that because a lot of our students are just 
They're going down the road away from statistics because they think they can't do them because somebody said it was wrong. Oh, it's easy. <laughs> Am I relating? We, we, if, if, if y'all are able to like put in IVs and uh, things like that, it. you could do statistics. <laughs> think about it like this. You, you do something to a patient, you don't know what the hell they're going to do. You know what I mean? You're sticking out, you say this, you say that. It's, it's like a combustible relationship, right? With the numbers, they're the numbers, they're on screen. You do this, this happens, this, that. It's a much more controlled. Oh, we're we're you just terrified. have to know the method. We're terrified somebody's going to say it's wrong. And that's when, if I, if you want us to bring this to an end for you, so you can get, pick, pick up the yeah, no, If you off. want to do that, I want to be able to say that we get the sense that it's wrong. What, what but what I want, I want to be, you know, did I report a Spearman or a Pearson? And I want to be able to say, that's when you call a statistician and you say in your defense, when you go to your defense, my statistician said, and then it just, um, I think you had that, now I know Judy Vesey was on one of the committees, it was Anna Tenapples, and one of the other methods people who learned that, well, it's, it's, it's not interval data, you can't run that, and they'll challenge you, and suddenly you get nervous, and I want everyone to be able to say with confidence that my statistician said. So to answer the question that we started with, do I need a statistics consultation? Mm -hmm. The answer, and thank you, Bill, You're is wrong. when someone's going to tell me I'm wrong, I'm going to call you. But, but also, it's like you said, like when, even when you get like top statisticians, they disagree with each other because it's not like a, a science. A lot of it's an art because it's like you get to one place and you could do A, B, or C. And different people, different, like, different um, authorities will even say, do A. No, I never do that. Do B. And I never do that. Well, it makes so, all of us who are just applied people nervous. Yeah, you just, you just have to be able to defend your position. Crazy. You know? Because, like, someone will say, well, why didn't you do this? And you say, well, like, for the multiple imputation. So if you're missing data, you could do multiple imputation, which estimates what the data would have been if the person reported it, right? So someone might say, well, why didn't you do multiple imputation? You know, and then you might say, well. Give me because, what's the answer. Yeah, because, like, from an ideological standpoint, I don't want to work with estimated data. I want to work with the actual data they gave. Because the estimated data could be right on target. Or it could be way off target. So you're you're giving up one or two things. You're either giving up people because they have missing data sometimes, or you're giving up the authenticity of the data because it's estimated. So either way, you're gaining something and losing something. You just have to say from an ideological standpoint, I feel like it's better to gain this and lose this than gain that and lose that. That's great. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, exactly. That really helped. Thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. It's great to see you all and everything. He's got to go pick up children. I yeah, I got to go. They're getting out. I got to get back to Brooklyn because they're getting out at 2 o'clock. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. Oh, I got it, Bill. An estimated shot in the arm. Uh, <laughs> all right, thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll be in touch. I'll see you soon. Okay. If anyone needs anything, just email. Thanks, Bill. Okay. All right, see you all soon. Thank you. All right, pass that around for me. That, no, that's, that's what, pass that around for me. It's not just for you. Yeah, no. Yeah. Take one pass the rest. <laughs> take one pass the rest. <laughs> I always let you do that. Take one pass. I'll take the clip off. Just hand them off. There's one for you. I won't let you try and find that one. I always let me shut the recording off. Shut the recording off. Now I'm going to follow up this talk. Actually, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep the recording on because what I wanted to do was now tell you. And I don't know if anybody's still outside in the hinterland. Let me see if I have any other attendees. Oh, Keith still. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Um, what I wanted to be able to then follow up, and I wanted Bill to come here, because what we've done with his stats whisperer, um, is it good? Yeah, you said you're welcome, Keith. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, um, Bill gave, uh, I bought his whole course, his seminar, I own it, and it's mine, and he gave me permission to use any pieces of it with any people that would want it. So what my, my two research assistants did this year was they put together, they're not on the shelf yet, but when you come down here, you'll be able to pull off the shelf two large notebooks. The notebooks will have a cover of what's in a module, 
It'll have the web address, and it'll show you the screen so you can see if it's too basic and I don't need it, or if it gets to the part, like I said, I replay that Neil Diamond one over and over to remember EX, which one, where am I looking for the odds ratio, which ones are low, which ones are the one minus, which ones, because I can't remember that kind of detail. So I go back and use them. So they'll be on the shelf for all the faculty and all the students to use if they need them. I can't have everybody take the whole books out because this is what he makes a living doing. And it's appropriate that I don't just give a course to someone, but because if you don't have the, Laura, you did the whole thing, right? Yeah. Is it, is it 14 hours? Is it an hour for each one? You mean the? The webinars. Um, let me think. The seven it's steps. Easy. Is it about seven it was a hours? Six weeks. It was a six weeks. Uh, six program. weeks. So you did it live over right. once a week, and right. that's synchronous, so you right. have to be, he sets it up for the time, but it's certainly worth, I've tried to figure out whether we have all of our students simply take that as a modular course, but we have so many other things we do, and it could very well be, and Maria and I have figured out there are certain things that you need to be able to have a student go do that's independent or any or, or colleagues. You know, go, go review how to put the date. He has exactly how to put it into SPSS. He does it step by step. So if you're trying to review something and you don't want in any way for someone to know that that stuff confuses you, because all of us have that. We used to call it, um, when we were teaching faculty how to use Word, or how to, oh, it was once it wasn't even, it was Multimate or, or the Internet. And we um, used to say you needed a brown paper bag so you didn't let anybody know as people started getting good. You didn't know it. You really had to hide. You hadn't done it. And there's no reason for this. I think that this is that the kind of work that everyone could take a piece of. So look for the books. Or, or they'll be on the shelf, I hope, by the end of the semester. And know that we built this so we have the statistics supplement. Now, Patty and Anne-Marie and I and Lois and some other folks are talking about producing other kinds of podcasts. Um, Aaliyah, you, 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 you didn't get volunteered yet, but you're in it too, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have podcasts available too. But, uh, you know, just to say, go find it, it's on the web. What I really thought was important was to have a book on the shelf. It'll show you the web address for the YouTube, and it'll tell you exactly what's in it, so you don't sit there and spend an hour and a half to get out one frame that you want to get at. So that's the plan. And it's very good. Thank you very much, guys. on the internet, sometimes it's more not as clear. I agree. I agree. You know, sometimes some sites are better than others in terms of explanation. Yeah, yeah. Direction. So thank you very much, guys, for, for coming. And, uh, and uh, we got another. Let me shut this uh, recording down. Leah, you didn't sign the attendance. I did.